see. And I'm going to talk about the two trips I've made with David and others to um, the east coast of Italy, the northeast side of Italy, fairly high up. Um, I hope the other map will just give you an idea, it's sort of just below the curve where it goes over, it below Ravenna. So the two towns that we worked in are Cesina and Cesinatico. Okay. The, they're in the province of Emilia Romagna, just south of the famous city of Ravenna, which has the most amazing Roman mosaics. David and I spent some time there, quite considerable in their beauty. So, Cesinatico is actually an ancient seaport with quite a history, and Cesina is in about a half hour journey inland. Now, our story starts with Joseph. Okay, he attended this conference a few years ago. Uh, some of you may remember him. He arrived on the shores of Italy as an African refugee about 10 years ago. And he now has permanent residency in Italy with a job and access to all public benefits, and he's married, and he now has a little boy. When he arrived, he uh, wasn't um, a believer that we, as we know it, but he was a, 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 you know, interested in Christianity. He found himself questioning basic Christian teachings, but particularly the Trinity. And he started searching online for some answers. And he came across, guess what, the Kerlings website. And so he then wrote to Duncan asking for the book, The Real Christ. And emails were exchanged, and also the book Bible Basics was posted. Now, Brother Roy Boyd, who was in my collegiate actually in Nottingham, was enlisted to exchange further emails with him and he did an excellent job in answering Joseph's questions. So in the end, D uh, Duncan visited Joseph in Italy and baptised him. One thing that was a real concern for Joseph were the continuous stream of boats overloaded with very exhausted and distressed African refugees from Libya arriving on the coast in Chesapeake. And he saw them wandering aimlessly on the streets and in Chesina, and he wanted to help them. And he would stop and, and give assistance wherever he could. And he asked Duncan to send copies of Bible Basics and Free Bibles as well to offer the true gospel to them, inviting as many as he could back to his flat for Bible study. Now at this point, Duncan was invited to go over to Italy to help to teach feed and baptise some of those that were ready in order to try to build up a small ecclesia. So a small team of us from the UK went over in the summer of 2017. We hired a villa in the hills above Cesina and with Joseph's help, help we searched out refugee camps in and around Cesina taking food and Bibles. We also found quite a number living on the streets and made arrangements to meet up later in the day with food and Bible study. Now, the Italian government have in the past been quite helpful to the refugees, giving them about three months, ex uh, either way, accommodation and basic funds for them to find their feet. But as we know, things are changing in Italy and political parties are using the refugee crisis to fuel a fear among the electoral uh, against these immigrants promising that if they're elected, they'll send them all back to Africa. But in the midst of all this chaos, the Christian message is being preached. The refugees are desperate for the news of the gospel and baptism into Christ, which considering we nearly died in water is quite a courageous step. We prepared hearty chicken and meat stews in the villa with plenty of veg and spice and served it with rice in plastic bowls to as many groups in the four camps that we could find. Although we did have to be careful as the authorities were not happy that we were feeding them and on a couple of occasions turned a bit nasty and we actually had to make a very hasty retreat from one particular camp. The one, um, I don't know which one I'm on. Yeah. It was on the previous picture. Um, on one, uh, yes, very hasty retreat from the camp when a couple of guys actually trapped us in. 
and threatened to call the police. And thanks to Duncan's very quick thinking, we made a very bumpy exit through some undergrowth. We managed to get away. Thank you very much. We also visited, and this is the picture on the right, the basement of a shop kindly loaned by the owner of by the bus station where we met many of the Africans living on the streets. You can see I am doing my usual arm movements. Um, that was one of the moment that Duncan does to me. He says, listen, Mr. Duncan, go off and sort something out. Give them a talk for about half an hour, please. Okay, good fun. That year, we baptised about 28 Africans in the sea. And that really caused quite a stir among the well uh, talented sunbathers who crowded the beach. You can imagine it, can't you? Because obviously they have really um, un unsettled feelings about the Africans. But when we take a whole crowd of them onto a beach and then line them up in the sea, you know, you can imagine the interest. Um, Duncan's children there enjoying the, the water as, the, as they're being baptised, and David posing beautifully. <laughs> And uh, there's Joseph again, talking to a group who came to him and asked him questions about what we were doing. And he caused quite a stir <coughs> on the beach. Last summer, we returned. So we're now in Chesnatico, which is on the coast. We returned to give further support to the work of Joseph. We met two of his friends, local residents, <coughs> Michael and Samson who were ready for baptism. So straight away, the same day, we went straight down to the beach. Um, I'm seated at the table, just doing a sort of pre-baptism talk with them about it being the most important day of their lives. And uh, they were so receptive. There we go. Samson and Michael. We also had with us the Skinners um, and Duncan's parents in law. So Robin and Steve were with us as well. Russell and Dawn, thank you, you knew I'd forgotten. <laughs> Terrible memory. Okay. Now, okay, so there we are, the first baptisms. The next day, we then tried to find some refugee camps, but there were many of them were closed by now. But we did find one. Um, it was, it was right down near the beach, and while we were waiting outside the camp, a homeless African called Francis walked up, because he was attracted by the high vis verse, offering free Bible, Bibles, and he asked if he could have a Bible. And this began our journey with this lovely man. The manager of the camp told us that we weren't welcome in the camp, because there were quite a number of Muslims living there. So Joseph and Duncan decided to focus on Francis for the meanwhile. Francis took them to the derelict building where he was living, and I mean derelict. He introduced them to the squalor of his living conditions with drug dealers standing in the yard, rubbish lying everywhere. It had been gutted with fire and the plastic cutting on the walls and handrails had all melted and it was peeling. And Some of the group went back later in the evening with food found Francis living in a room with a small chair in it on which he had placed his NEV Bible. On his door he had painted a cross with the word Jesus. Francis had always wanted to be baptised and so that next day we took him down to the sea. I love those pictures. Okay. Francis told us how he had been trafficked by smuggling gangs in Libya who sold him on to other gangs, who tortured him to get his phone back to Guyana to get money to send to them. Because he couldn't, he was sold on cheaply to other gangs who again tried to extort money and buy torture. He also watched many being killed in the process. Francis has a wife and two children back in Ghana but can't return as he has no documents because they've all been taken from him. We were eventually able to make contact with quite a number of Christian refugees in the camp. And so we arranged to meet them between the camp and the sea, this wooded area. Very nice and comfortable and out of the bright sunlight. We met them every day, taking with us food and Bible literature. If any of you want to know how to cook yams, 
I am an expert. <laughs> weird things. Totally weird, like lumps of wood. We listen to their horrific stories about torture, abuse, electric shock treatment, and the rest in the hands of the Libyans, trying to extract money from them. And then the horrors of their treacherous sea journeys to Sicily and then on to Italy, only to find they were unwelcome and unable to make a living. Their stories reduced us to tears. These are lovely people with families and children back home who've been used by unscrupulous men with false promises of a better life elsewhere. Duncan and I gave many talks on a wide ranging field of first principle Bible subjects and they listened. They listened hard and several baptisms took place. I always remember that picture of Stephen holding Daniel and David. He loved them and they loved him. Every time we saw him, they ran up to him and he picked them both up. The guy on the left is Ossahan. He was really keen to get involved. He came to all the talks. He showed real enthusiasm for organising the others. His, his story was really tragic. But he's actually continued. All right, and I hear from him every day. On our last day, we were able to actually go into the hostel. And one of the refugees had prepared a room for us, setting out the chairs in rows, like a little church room, which I changed and moved around a bit. I gave a talk from Colossians chapter 3 with advice on how to organise a Bible study session, trying to equip them to be able to move forward. Um, they were always very keen to read, so I asked Stephen to read, and I only made him read a verse at a time, and he really found that hard. He just wanted to read, keep going. I said, no, I just want you to read verse 1. Just one verse, yes. And by doing that, by going through the chapter, one verse at a time, and then picking it and telling them how to go about it, they said yes, that was a way that they could themselves move forward with their own Bible study. So it was just, uh, it was all a bit rushed. I <coughs> couldn't uh, quite get there, you know, obviously, I don't know why I've gone on from that, I should still be on that picture. So, we had this session, and hopefully, you know, we were able to set them up. Now later in the day, this is the final day, this is Friday, we received a message from Michael, who we baptised with Samson on the first day, that his sister, Tina, and Samson's brother, wanted to get baptised too. These are long-term residents. These are people who are not refugees. So, this was tea time now. We hastily arranged a meeting at our caravan site and had some quick study, Bible study with questions and their enthusiasm. And they, but they knew they'd already been discussing things with Joseph and others as well. So they, they, they had a basic understanding. Um, and so we then rushed down to the beach to make our final trip and our final baptisms. And Dawn Skinner helped Duncan. And it was nice for her to be able to, to baptise Tina, who was... Uh, really, really excited. It was a very fitting end to a very spiritual week. Since our visit, um, I've emailed a good number of talks and exhortations to Joseph and Ossifer to use with the group and, to, and for those in the flat as well. But if any of you want to do that, you know they'd be only too happy to receive material to be able to use. We left Italy with heavy hearts. I know I, I, I was really emotional because I thought they've only just got going and we're leaving them behind, you know? And uh, it just didn't feel, feel right somehow. So we were very concerned because we didn't know, like they don't know, their future. Um, 
I was particularly concerned about Francis because of the awful conditions he was in. The others were together in a hostel. They had each other um, and, 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 and a reasonable standard of living. But poor old Francis was in the most awful state. Um, and we did what we could do. We, we, we helped him. He was asthmatic, so we got him some medical supplies. But his situation seemed hopeless. And I just remember going home. You know I'm emotional anyway. But I just spent several days crying and praying for him. I just felt so, so sad for his situation. He had worked previously in the winter on the building site um, and they'd allowed him to sleep there. It was in the middle of the winter um, and given him basics so he could buy some food. So, you know, he, he, he was just hunting our survival. And he hasn't any documents. He, he's stuck in one place, no state support. And this is a very, he belongs to an underclass of very desperate people. And I know that all the rest of us in the group felt the same about Francis and had all been making it a matter of serious prayer. But something really amazing happened. Okay. Francis was looking out of his window, broken, smashed up window, crying and praying, not knowing what to do. And he noticed a white man breaking into a car and he felt moved to film it on his mobile phone. The man returned a few times and continued to break in cars, so it was a pattern of behaviour. He even came back and towed a car away. And yet, Francis is catching this on video. So he came in the van and took a car away. Others he cut around the seals of the windows and removed valuables. Of course, people who have their cars break into think it's the African refugees. Okay? So Francis took three videos, and each time had a strange feeling about this. And he felt that God was involved here, and he took the videos to a police station and told them who he was. He was a migrant living in the derelict building near the beach, and he gave them the videos. And they were absolutely delighted to receive them because this had man had been such a problem in the area. They held an identity parade and asked Francis to identify the man. He's a 60-year-old local Italian who had been stealing and breaking into cars for some time. And as a result of this, the police actually ordered Francis to be given permanent residency in Italy for his services to the country. Now, this is an absolutely impossible dream of every African migrant. At best, they're given temporary leave to remain with no rights until a time that they can be deported. But Francis, however, has been given the promise of permanent residency with the full right to work and access to public benefits. He's now waiting in faith for this to happen. He was given a paper allowing him this. And we pray most earnestly, because I have checked recently, it's all slow, but he, we pray. Can we pray for Francis? that he gets his papers. Kelly supplied a heater to keep him warm, a gas burner to keep him warm. And in October of last year, Brother Peter and Sister Dave and Tresca visited from Canada. It's Francis on the right, making a follow-up visit to them to encourage Joseph and the Africans. While well, the other Africans are still in this camp, I hear from Austin, as I say, every day. He sends me Bible quotes, and I do a little talk based on Bible talk, uh, the quote he sent me, and I make a little thought for the day. They've not yet been evicted, but they've been told that they're going to be evicted very soon. Joseph meets regularly with the local African residents that we baptise, Michael, Samson, Tina, and Samuel, and also continues to work with the refugees in the centre of Jacina, a few of which live with him. He reports that their little ecclesia is growing and maturing, but their situation is so uncertain in a country where the government, government promotes so much hate and fear against the immigrants. They want to expel them back to their countries of origin. So they need our prayers, brothers and sisters. But out of this human tragedy has come hope and salvation so many have found Christ and were grateful for the opportunity of being able to assist Joseph 
in the setting up of an inclusion in Italy and pray that God will continue to bless the work as we wait for the Lord's return. Thank you. Thanks so, so much, Liz. Uh, it's, it's very moving, isn't it? And also, actually, 